Um, and with that, I think that's everything. Okay. So, so enjoy. <laughs> yeah, guys, enjoy. And I'm gonna introduce the first student speaker to you. So, um, Mordula Arankuma is uh, our very own cognitive neuroscience uh, research master student. Uh, she does her internship this year. She's originally from India and she started to study in Nijmegen uh, for the master. Um, she, um, let's see, oh yeah. <laughs> so considering how much we use language and engage in some form of music uh, activity every day, it fascinates her to discover the ways she can influence, uh, she can, um, it, we can influence it uh, by each other, along with studying the different factors that enhance it. She will cover uh, more about uh, the connection between language and music in her talk. So please give her a big applause. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, yeah, firstly, I want to thank Synapsium for this opportunity and also Amy for the nice introduction. Um, so this is basically my master thesis that uh, is basically about how language and music influence each other. And it's supervised by uh, Dr. Makiko Sarakata, who's also collaborating with the Music Cognition Lab in Amsterdam. So just to have a brief introduction, uh, Music is something that we all engage in on a day to day basis, like either we are professional musicians or sometimes even like a small form of like bathroom singing. So most of us tend to have some form of music a part of us in, in a day to day basis. Uh, another thing that is also common in our everyday life is communication. So language is something that we also use every day. Uh, but to think about how these two factors that uh, happen to us on a day-to-day -day basis, to think of how they can actually influence each other is the basis of my talk today. And research has actually found that music has an influence on language, and there's also a possibility that it happens the other way around, from language to music. So this is the core idea of my talk, and I'll proceed with just a background information about the whole uh, idea. So if you consider language and music, um, they they, they tend to have like different names, but then if you think about it, they're one and the same. So language and music uh, share a lot of features and the two most common ones that they share are rhythm and pitch. So if you think about rhythm, in, with respect to languages, uh, there's this concept called linguistic rhythm, where each uh, language is characterized by uniform uh, time intervals that exist between successive units of speech. So that can be, for example, stress or syllable or mora time. So for example, in stress time languages like English or Dutch, there is a uniform time interval that exists between two consecutive stress marks. So that's the main idea with respect to linguistic rhythm. And as you all know, there is uh, an aspect of rhythm that exists in any form of music. So that's one way how language and music share the rhythmic feature. When it comes to pitch, there is this aspect called lexical tone. So that's when you have the pitch differences that exist in, in languages like Chinese, for example, which is a tonal language. So here, differences in pitch actually indicate a different word. So it's not necessarily like an intonation, but it gives a whole different meaning by itself. I can give you an example of how it sounds in Chinese. Ma, 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 ma. So if you notice, these four are the exact same words, but given in a different pitch, and they actually mean four different things. So that's how tone is integrated in language. And then, as you all know, there is a pitch aspect that occurs in music that indicates a high tone or a low tone. So this is one aspect that is common in both languages and music. But if you think about how these share these common features, there is also a possibility that they have overlapping brain regions. So, for example, in uh, lexical and melodic processing, they tend to share the same cerebral structures. And also with respect to semantics, uh, it's the same uh, regions that process for both music and languages. And also, uh, musicians tend to exhibit stronger activation in language-related areas than uh, non-musicians. So considering how uh, these two auditory domains have a lot of overlapping features, it's interesting to know how they have an influence on each other, which is the transfer effect. 
So this can happen from language to music or also from music to language. So for example, if you have an expertise in one domain, there is a possibility that you can be better in the other domain. So for example, from music to language, if you have superior melodic skills, then you tend to have an enhanced perception or better pronunciation in a second language. But then if you consider from language to music, that's also been shown where uh, you see visible uh, enhanced pitch perception when you are a Chinese English bilingual or even a Chinese native speaker as compared to other non-tonal language speakers. So this is the whole idea of the transfer effect, which is also the backbone of our study. So specifically in our study, we're going to talk about uh, studying this language to music transfer by uh, looking at different uh, language, uh, linguistic background groups. So for this one, we uh, chose people who are learning Chinese and compared them with uh, bilinguals who do not have any tonal language exposure. And our main aim is to find if there are any differences in the melodic perception between the groups and also uh, we're interested to find if there is a difference or any correlation between the lexical tone discrimination, that is the tones in the Chinese language, with melodic perception. So this is also in line with a split hypothesis that was, um, uh, uh, that was given by Chen and colleagues, where they believed that uh, people who are uh, efficient in discriminating uh, lexical tones need not show, uh, like, uh, need not be related to musical perception because they tend to split the processing of tones into lexical tone and musical tones. So that's another aspect of our study that we're going to look at. And how did we do this? So basically we aim to recruit 30 uh, native Dutch speakers who are learning Chinese, but at the moment we have 12 beginners and 9 advanced learners, so we aim to have 15 and 15. Uh, and then we also have a data set from an earlier study that consists of 15 Dutch English bilinguals. So before the start of the experiment, the participant had to fill in a survey that had a language background questionnaire along with a basic idea about their Chinese learning history. And we also wanted to have an idea about their musical background just to make sure they weren't prof prof like professional musicians. Um, so what were the main um, experiments that were used? So the main idea that was uh, a part of this experiment is to find out their melodic perception. So that was done through the musical ear test, which uh, is a test that's used to assess a person's musical aptitude in general. So this test was split into two parts, which was the melody part and the rhythm part. So the main idea of this test was to listen to a short phrase of melodic phrases and they had to uh, guess if they sounded the same or different. So with the melody part, I have two examples and probably you can also try and see if you can see any differences. Okay, so the first part of this, this was cut. Maybe I can play again. So this is an example of a trial that has a similar melodic phrases. And this is an example of one that is not. So they differed only in one key and that's the difference that the participant had to find out and uh, predict if they were same or different. And the same also goes with rhythm, but then obviously instead of piano phrases, it was rhythmic beats. I can also show you an example from that. And this is uh, another example that showed differences. So probably you must have noticed that this one was different from the first one that was played. So this was the whole idea of the experiment and it was uh, for 20 minutes. And then the other part of the experiment was the Chinese tone discrimination task. So this was a similar where they listened to uh, Chinese tone pairs 
and they had to click same if they sounded the same, different if they were different. And they were also divided into two parts. One was the disyllabic part where it appeared as disyllabic tones, so they came in pairs. Whereas the other one was monosyllabic discrimination where it was basically one tone and then another tone. So they just had to discriminate between the two. Apart from these two experiments, we also did uh, working memory measures just to make sure everybody was at the same level. So for that one, we did the backward digit span where uh, basically you will listen to a series of numbers and then you need to repeat that backwards. But then the other one was a phonological memory task, which was called the Motia test. So this is also a repetition task, but then instead of numbers, you listen to pseudo words and you just have to repeat them the way you hear it. Um, so this is also the preliminary results uh, section and it has not been published yet. So I would request that it's not on any social media or photographed. Uh, so we basically did an analysis of covariance to just to find if there was any influence of the covariates, let's address the backward digit span, the Motia test, uh, and the influence on melodic perception. But then we did not find any uh, significant difference between the groups. So this was just um, mean of the melodic perce perception score between the three language groups. And even here, we did not see a significant difference, although Visually, if you look at it, advanced learners do have a higher mean compared to the other langu uh, language groups, but then we cannot say anything for sure since there is no uh, significant difference. And then the other one that we did was to find out the influence of their lexical tone discrimination with respect to the melodic perception. And this one we focused only between the uh, proficiency level, so to see if there was any difference between the beginners and advanced learners. So in that, uh, this one shows the scores of the monosyllabic discrimination as well as the disyllabic discrimination. Uh, although there is a trend towards a positive correlation, it was still not significant. Uh, but then, interestingly enough, the trend was different for advanced learners, but at the same time, it was not significant. So we really cannot say anything, but possibly uh, this moves in the direction that says that beginners uh, tend to not have the entire tonal exposure that leads them to perceive the tones similar to musical tones. So in that way, uh, there is a relationship between um, the tone discrimination and melodic perception. Uh, there might be a relationship, but then when it comes to advanced learners, they are already proficient in Chinese. That makes them um, like, uh, like the ability to split the tonal inf uh, input as lexical tone and musical tone. So that's probably the reason that explains this trend, although it's uh, not uh, significantly correlated. So just to wrap up with the discussions, um, this uh, basically shows that there isn't a significant difference with respect to the melodic score when you compare the three language groups. But then at the same time, when you look at the uh, tone discrimination and between the proficient uh, learners and the beginners, you see that it goes in line with the split hypothesis that I mentioned earlier. So basically, the split hypothesis tells that if you are a native Chinese uh, speaker, then you tend to split the processing of the tonal input as lexical tone and musical tone in a way that says that there is no uh, possible correlation that exists. So that was what uh, we saw in the previous slide where you did not see any correlation between the performance of beginners and uh, uh, advanced learners with respect to melodic perception. So that is uh, an interesting finding that we saw from the study that they also replicate the same uh, behavior that is tend to be seen by Chinese native speakers as well. So that's an interesting one. But at the same time, these are just uh, preliminary results. As you see, we do not have the entire data set yet, but it tends to move in this direction. Uh, so with the final slide, I want to just put it up with this image where if you think about it, music and language is something that is integrated in even the smallest uh, parts of our lives. Like we. Like I'm pretty sure sometimes some of us tend to learn something with the help of a song or we just uh, compose it in a mode of singing. So that's in a way interesting to look at how these two domains, uh, although they are different and they exist independently, can have an influence on each other. So that's the message that I want to put across considering the theme of the conference, that this could possibly un be a new wave of investigation in the ocean of neuroscience. So, thank you. Um, 
Are there any questions? I'm open to answer them. So basically the split hypothesis uh, talks about how if you are a Chinese native speaker then you do not have the ability to perceive the tonal input that you receive as a general acoustic input. You tend to perceive it as a lexical aspect that is only relevant to language and a musical aspect that's only specific to music. So if you uh, look at the uh, transfer effect, I think in the study by Chen et al, where they use this to compare between uh, Turkish English uh, bilinguals and also Turkish uh, monolinguals. So for in, when you did the same analysis for people who do not have a language, a tonal language exposure, they saw a significant correlation between uh, their tone discrimination and the melodic perception. So that indicates that uh, the tonal input that they receive uh, is perceived in the same acoustic way that's uh, used to perceive any musical tone. So they just perceive it as music as a whole, which uh, shows that it's correlated whether it comes from a lexical perspective or from musical perspective, they tend to see it the same way. So that's why there is a correlation between the tone uh, discrimination and the melodic perception with uh, non-tonal language speakers, like Turkish, for example. Yeah? Yeah? Just out of curiosity, other than Chinese, what other languages have this tonal aspect? Um, there are other uh, Asian languages. I think uh, Vietnamese also has uh, tones in the languages and then uh, one Indian language called Punjabi also has tones in the languages so I think uh, they're from like uh, part of Asia but then uh, I also know that uh, uh, the limber is also a bit tonal so yeah Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. There wasn't a significant difference. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. So you said about Chinese has like tone, tonal system. So I'm wondering that like in other tonal languages such as Vietnamese and other uh, languages which exploits more tones, have you like? considered that there might be like a difference between those, I mean, tone languages, would it be better to also have like a set of people who studies like other mm -hmm. tonal languages? Yeah, that could also be interesting because I think uh, Chinese and Vietnamese also differ with the number of tones in their languages. So yeah, that could also be an interesting effect to find maybe if you have more tones in your language, then you tend to have better ears to perceive melodic differences. So yeah, that could also be an interesting thing to look at. Yeah. I, I heard that in Africa there are some languages which use clicking, like yeah, or something like this. Um, do you know any results about those people? Whether they also have better melodic or better rhythmic? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting, but, but I haven't read anything on those lines. But yeah, especially considering the rhythmic influence, that could be the case. So yeah, it might be again interesting. But this is also, uh, I, I mean, I don't want to say it's a new field, but then it's getting towards uh, uh, finding out the integration between the two domains. So that would possibly also lead in that direction. And maybe one day there can be a result in that line. Yeah. Do you know if there's like a scientific study uh, that learning actually enhances the learning? And if yes, uh, how does it work on a new scientific basis? 
so you mean studies where they show music as a aid to learning? Yes. Uh, well, that's the like that's the main idea of studying the transfer effect because if you also notice in the background uh, slide, I mentioned that they have been evidences that show uh, language and music share uh, brain resources. So that could possibly be leading towards in that direction. Like for example, if you notice, if one can influence the other, like for example, being proficient in a language can help you also learn music better. Then that could indicate that there is some overlapping brain regions um, that share resources that can uh, like compensate one for the other, for example. So yeah, it, it can move into the direction, but this is just a behavioral study, so I do not have any like strong uh, opinion or like strong evidence that can say for sure that there is a brain uh, overlap region, but then it is a possible track because I mean, there is, a lot of studies that also show, uh, like they study music independently with, uh, without the influence of language. So that also indicates that there is a better like executive functioning and tends to move towards that side. So when you study both together, then you can find interesting stuff about how they inter interact in the brain level. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not in the original, like when you learn your first language, it's in the language area, but sometimes the second language moves. So I was wondering if there's maybe um, that you didn't find an effect because the people learned the language too late in their lives, actually. Well, yeah, that could possibly explain the effect that they did not have um, better melodic perception. But then if you looked at the... Um, slide that explains the lexical tone correlation with the melodic perception, they performed similar to how uh, Chinese native speakers perform. So that, uh, that shows that maybe like the ability to perceive lexical tones is similar to how native speakers perceive. So yeah, probably maybe with the melodic part, it might be the case, but also it can be the case that they are like native Dutch speakers. So yeah, like you said, a second language influence could possibly explain that effect. But then with respect to the other one, they showed similar behavior like native speakers. Yeah. Okay, thank you.